Now it was the story that changed the world. A story that not only changed journalism in Kenya, but also introduced the coverage of terrorism to Kenyan journalists. Tonight on special assignment, Asha Mwilu tells the untold story of the scribes who documented the 1998 bombing in Nairobi. Friday, August the 7th, 1998, began like any ordinary news day for journalists across the city of Nairobi. The tea lady, Joki, had just come and served me a cup of tea on my table. And we were joking about the tea and saying, today is Friday, many reporters are out, so today I can have two cups, maybe two and a half. As KTN news anchor and reporter Christine Ngoko waited for her morning tea, her colleagues from different newsrooms were already on their day's beat. Yusuf Ali, then a reporter with state broadcaster KBC, was covering a press conference between the then Trade Minister J.J. Kamotho and the then U.S. Ambassador Prudence Bushnell. Lina Skaikai, then a young reporter with KTN, was covering an economic conference along Mbagadi Way. Ondeko Aura, also a budding reporter then at KBC, was at County Hall awaiting proceedings of the Akiwumi Commission. And Yusuf Washira, who then headed Nation Newspaper's camera unit, had assigned all his men and waited in the newsroom for any urgent assignment. It seemed like there was a shaking of the building, just slightly either the building or the, the furniture. So the tea had spilt a little bit. So we thought, hi, that was quite an explosion that the tea has actually spilt. Most of the guys on board. Yusuf Ali had just exited the concluded Kamotho Bushnell press briefing to cover a bunker's strike downstairs at Cooperative House. We had a mild blast. And the first thing that came to our mind was that it could be that some tags may have been fallen, so we rushed towards where the blast was. And when we just took a few steps towards where the first blast was coming from, which was close to where the U.S. Emb embassy was then, then there was the main blast. And immediately, my cameraman fell. So I took off with my camera and heading towards the direction that the, the, the news that it has tipped me. The panel had not yet arrived. We dashed out with our camera. The instincts of a journalist, something big has happened. Now phone calls were coming on the landline in the newsroom saying there's been a bomb at the railway station. And people are bleeding, people are injured, the building has collapsed, and we thought, what? Newsrooms began scrambling to find out what was happening. As Christine Goku was rushed into studio to break the news, alarm was ringing across the city that something was not right. Somebody came and whispered to uh, Mwai Kibaki, former president, who later became president, whispered to him. And uh, Mr. Kibaki, who was at the podium, interrupted his own speech. He is adjourning the session. Those were the words that he used. We are adjourning these sessions immediately to attend to events that are happening in the city center. And I remember him saying, something terrible has happened. At the time, computers, I think we had only one computer which had the auto queue, and we needed to type the story in the newsroom and then go to the studio with the story typed on a piece of paper. There was no time to type that story. We literally I noticed also that the crowd running towards me, half of them uh, were bleeding and the others were screaming. And I had no choice now, I had to go to the direction, deeper into the direction where they were coming from. We ran down um, Harambe Avenue towards the direction of uh, the smoke. What we encountered was horrifying. There was this big crowd running towards me in a very confused manner, running towards me from Hilton. And they had filled the road and the motorists were hooting and, and so forth. You know, we have two sentences. There has been an explosion. We suspect it is a tanker and people have been injured. We shall give you more details after this. So I go on air. And that's all I said. 
I have to cross the road past Hilton and the crowd is getting thicker and more desperate. They are more bleeding and now not only bleeding, they are now screaming. At some point in time I picked a battery, a camera battery and that camera battery had the initials KBC. I instinctively knew it belonged to a colleague of mine who had gone to cover the function between the Trade Minister Kamotho and uh, Ambassador Bushnell. I was terrified. I felt I should first go for the camera so I could take maybe the shots of the building. And when I picked the camera, the lens had cracked, so it couldn't do anything. So I decided now to concentrate on my cameraman who was down. So I went for him, uh, dragged him from where he was, and pulled him to uh, an adjacent uh, parking that was uh, besides X Telecom House, between Central Bank of Kenya and X Telecom House. The crew that had been at um, Cooperative House had actually filmed a little bit through the window of what happened downstairs. So we went from the press conference, the explosion, and the little clip. So now we had a little bit more, and we were the first with this. What happened to your, to your cameraman? Well, I think the first blast that happened, um, I think there the, the, the must have been a stone that um, flew from Ofundi building and hit him on the forehead. And uh, that's how he fell. And fortunately, um, three months later, he died. We arrived at the door of Cooperative House where there was a lot of activity. And we saw the scene that met us there was that of Joseph Kamodo, the Minister uh, for Commerce and Industry at the time, being carried out of the building. I remember uh, the bodyguards holding him. I saw a Kenya bus service uh, which had stalled on the ground, on the road rather, windows shattered, bodies in. We also saw Prudence Bushnell, who was in that same building for a meeting, leaving the building as well, again being uh, escorted by aides. What am I shooting? Is a sudden collapsed building. It looks so fresh because it's still, the rubbles are still, the debris are still moving from the top downwards to the road. And it's coming with metal, with all that noise and smoke and flame and screams. There are people being carried by the debris. And then there was this image that stuck to my mind to date. Seeing a police officer running, but firmly holding on to his firearm. And they were trying to convince him that they need to go to hospital. And I remember the AP officer was resisting. He was holding his gun at the ready, but he was completely bloody. <laughs> It was a very brave image, I must say. Uh, sort of an image of resilience at the time that the country was uh, under attack. That confusion of people calling, you know, all that. All that. People were crying. All that sound captured on camera. And we just played the footage as it was. If you think about it today, you'd say, hmm. Maybe we were not ethical because we put a lot of blood on air that day. By around one o'clock it had been confirmed it was bomb blast in news, through the news, uh, radio, TV and the rest. It, has been, it had been confirmed it, it was a bomb, it was terrorist bomb attack. The concept of terror was new to the media, totally new. So new that in the KTN newsroom where I was working, we were struggling to spell Osama bin Laden. Is it Osama with U? Is it Osama with O? It is the Americans who introduced that word terrorism, that it was a terrorist attack. So we thought, what is terrorism? Not that we didn't know what it means, but now we wanted to understand it in our context. 
what is terrorism? What does it entail? And when you say it is terrorism, what does it mean? Is it like it's a continuous war? Is it a one-off thing? What is it? I think it was a wake-up call for the security personnel. How could this have been plotted for such a long time? Those are questions that must have been on the minds of the security apparatus then. And that was not the only challenge these journalists were facing. Rescue efforts were underway. And underneath the rubble, the voice of a lady called Rose had caught everyone's attention. Rose kept giving hope that she'll come out alive. And I remember any person recovered from the rubble alive, there was a loud cheer that went around the place. There was a huge effort, psychologically, morally, physically, trying to just get Rose to come out. The Israeli security defense forces team that came to assist brought in a lot of oxygen um, cylinders. And I remember they were pumping oxygen into the rubble to keep not just Rose, but any other person under the rubble alive. She was not a story anymore. She'd become our relative, she'd become our friend. We stuck there waiting for Rose and she didn't come out alive. It was very sad. It was very, very sad. I remember another person who was very badly affected by that was Lena Skaikai. I felt the terrorists are winning again. They exploded the bomb a few days earlier, killed a lot of people instantly. And here now, the one person that the country has been waiting to come out alive, she dies. Rose dies. I felt defeated. I felt this is terrible. We were totally broken down. And indeed, yes, I was broken. So that's the first time I saw President Moy having this face of very concerned, deep, touched uh, father. And you could see the emotion on his face. And so were his security men. They, they, they were human beings proper. That, that soldier business was not there. He looked startled. He looked a bit shaken, but more angry. And at the same time, reassuring for a country that was in the middle of a terrible uh, incident. People really should sort their problems without terrorizing others. How do, you, how do, how do they expect others to support those who are ambitious to kill innocent, innocent people, how do you expect this to uh, support from people of Kenya? Kenya? Kenya has always lived in peace against no one. Why should they target Kenya? As an individual and then as a Kenyan citizen, I felt our country, me and my country, Kenya, my beloved country, Kenya, I felt lonely and helplessness. That's one time when I saw uh, the former President Moi and the opposition actually coming together to mourn, to stand as one, to express their grief with Kenyans who've been affected in this. There was unity among Kenyans. We all became so close, so tight. Everybody became a rescue operation person in, in their own way. I'm not sure the families of those who died, those who were injured, have healed. They probably are still asking, why would a person think to do something like that? Anyway, for us, we do the story and we move on. Two blasts rocked Nairobi on Friday, August the 7th, 1998. Two blasts that changed life for Kenyans as they knew it. 
two blasts that meant 224 people would never go back home to their loved ones and 5,000 others would carry the scars from that day forever. But even in the face of extreme tragedy, August the 7th, 1998 echoed the spirit of the Kenyan, that even in the most difficult of times, brotherhood and sisterhood became the wind that blew the Kenyan flag higher up into the sky. Asham Wilu for Citizen TV.